deciding to follow Jesus.
Please read responsibly by hand first. Psalm 77, page 693. I will cry aloud to God. I will cry aloud and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hands are stretched out by night. I will be tired. I refuse to be comforted. Skipping to verse 11. I will remember the works of the Lord. All time, wonders of all time. I will meditate on all your acts. And ponder your deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. Who is so great God, God. God. You are the God who works wonders. And have declared your power among the peoples. By your strength, you have redeemed your people. The children of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and trembled. The very depths were shaken. shaken. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed to and fro. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, and your paths in the great waters. Yet your footsteps were not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated for the first lesson. The first lesson is from 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah and Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you live your, yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted. You if not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elijah went over. Canticle 13 is on the Book of Common Prayer, in the Book of Common Prayer, page 90. Let us all recite. Glory to you, Lord God of our fathers. You are worthy of praise, glory to you. Glory to you for the radiance of your holy name. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you in the splendor of your temple. On the throne of your majesty, glory to you. Glory to you seated between the cherubim. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you beholding the depths and the high vault of heaven, glory to you. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Our second lesson from Galatians. For 
freedom. Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as opportunity for self-indulgence. But through the love, through love, become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Canticle 16 can be found on page 92 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us all recite. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior. Born in the house of his servant David, through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in the sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine those who dwell in the darkness and shadow of death, and to guide our feet in the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now, and will be forever. Amen. May be seated. The third lesson from Luke. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit 
for the kingdom of God. Sermons at Work is by the Reverend Joseph S. Pagano, who serves in the uh, Anglican Church of Canada. It's called The Way. Every journey is a quest. At least, that's what people who think about stories tell us. It doesn't matter if you're King Arthur in search of the Holy Grail, Don Quixote in search of his lady Dulcinea del Toboso, or Dorothy just trying to get home. And if our lives, from birth to death, from ignorance to wisdom, from exile to return, can be described as a journey, then we are also on a quest. And no quest is easy. Every time we set out on a journey, we will face trials and tribulations. These may come in the form of a dragon or an evil knight or flying monkeys, but by confronting these challenges, we will be transformed. We will not be the same people we were when we set out on a journey. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the beginning of what scholars call Luke's travel narrative. It is the story of Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, a movement from the north to the south. It is a journey for the life of he knew in Galilee the death he will experience in Jerusalem. It is a story in which Jesus will be transformed from a prophet to the crucified Messiah, and Jesus' followers will be transformed from bystanders into disciples. On the journey to Jerusalem, we explore the mystery at the very heart of the Christian faith, the mystery of who we are called to be and what we are called to do. The early Christians used to refer to themselves as the way. Luke, our gospel writer, is actually the first person to record this name for the early Christian movement. And it seems that by calling themselves the way, the early church was saying something really important about who they were. This was not a static or unsettled community. They did not refer to themselves as the immovable fortress of faith or the mighty temple of absolute truth. Rather, they referred to themselves as the way. And that is a name for a group of people who see themselves on the move, who find their true identity on the journey, who discover their deepest and truest lives as they follow Christ on his way of self-giving love. And this journey, like all journeys, will mean facing trials and tribulations. There will be risk and there will be conflict. But there is also a promise. The promise that on the journey we will be transformed. The promise that in losing our lives, our lives will be saved. The promise that on the way, we will find new and abundant life. Luke tells us when the days were near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and some of his disciples followed him on the way. The first episode of this journey occurs in Samaria. It is a fascinating story that we might think of as a bit of first century Middle Eastern road rage. Jesus and his disciples were traveling through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem. Now that, now, that Jesus chose a route through Samaria is itself an interesting detail, because Jews and Samaritans did not like each other. Like so many Middle Eastern neighbors, then and now, they had a centuries-long conflict going. One of the flashpoints had been the destruction of the Samaritan Temple around 128 B.C. by the Jewish ruler, John Hyrcanus, because he saw it as an unholy rival to the true temple in Jerusalem. A surefire way to get a group of people to really hate you is to destroy their place of worship. In fact, the dislike between Jews and Samaritans was so bad that in Jesus' day, many Jews avoided traveling through Samaria altogether. They would take a long detour around the whole country. There was sort of an unofficial travel advisory saying it was unsafe for Jews to travel through Samaria. Then, as now, there are just some places in the world where it is not safe to go. But Jesus does not take the detour around Samaria. He resolutely sets his face toward Jerusalem, and he begins traveling south of the road through Samaria. And, not surprisingly, because he is on his way to Jerusalem, the site of the hated temple of the Jews, Jesus is not welcome. Luke tells us that they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. At this point, his disciples, James and John, become enraged. They are traveling along, and the Samaritans basically blow them off, and they completely lose their temper. True to their nickname, the Sons of Thunder, they turn to Jesus, veins bulging and hearts pounding, and say, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Now this is some serious first century Middle Eastern road rage. A village does not welcome them on their way to Jerusalem. The disciples want to call down fire from heaven. Think about how different the meaning of the Christian life would be if Jesus had said yes to their request for vengeance. Can you imagine turning into the night in the news and hearing that there's a backup on the beltway because of a road rage incident? It's 
Seems like one of these aggressive drivers from D.C. cut off a van carrying the Sons of Thunder. Glory, hallelujah, praise van for the Church of St. James and St. John. The church members became so enraged that they called down fire from heaven, which completely consumed the vehicle from D.C. Emergency workers are on the scene. The cleanup could take several hours. Sometimes we may wonder where Jesus found these early followers. For goodness sake, they honestly asked Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Of course, Jesus says no to the disciples' request for violence and vengeance. In fact, he says no in the strongest possible terms. John tells us that Jesus rebuked them. In the Greek text, the verb to rebuke is what Jesus does when he encounters demons. In the disciples' request for vengeance, in their request to call down fire from heaven on their enemies, Jesus sees something demonic, and he rebukes them. No more vengeance. No more first century Middle Eastern road rage. The way of discipleship, the way of being a follower of Christ, is not to be the way of hatred and revenge. Traveling with Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, the disciples learn a deep truth about the Christian life. No more hate. No more retaliation. No more fire from heaven. Jesus had taught his disciples to love their enemies, to do good to those who hate him, to pray for those who mistreat him. In fact, Jesus had taught James and John these very lessons in the Sermon on the Plain before they had begun their journey through Samaria. And yet we know there's a big difference between understanding the words and living the truth of the words. Traveling with Jesus on their way to Jerusalem, the disciples learned the hard truth of loving their enemy. It is easy to say, but hard to do. It was hard to do then, and it is hard to do now. But we are called to follow a Lord who did not call down fire from heaven on his enemies. We are called to follow a teacher who told us to bless those who curse us and to pray for those who spitefully use us. We are called to follow Christ on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to the cross, where he did not curse his enemies, but rather pray, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The Christian life is a journey. It is a journey in which we discover our deepest and truest lives, the truth of who we are called to be, and how we are to live together in this world. The earliest Christians called themselves the way. On the road to Jerusalem, following Jesus on his way of self-giving love, the first disciples learned that they must die to the old ways of anger and hatred and rise to the new life of forgiveness and love. This may not have seemed like a realistic way for first century Jews traveling through Samaria to live. It may not seem like a realistic way to live in our present day world either. And yet it may be our only realistic hope for the future. On a dusty road in the middle of a hostile Middle Eastern country, some followers of Jesus asked, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Jesus turned to them, and he rebuked them, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, they met another person, and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Amen.
pleased God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Lord of the Virgin Mary. He suffered from the conscious of God, was crucified and died in the prayer. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again and judge us to the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We pray in your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. Lord, show us your mercy and love. Lord, we put our trust, trust in you. And you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never ever hope. Amen. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you as eternal life and to serve you as perfect proof, defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard work of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your Holy Spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we entrust all who are dear to us, those persons whose names appear on our prayer list people in Ukraine, people suffering in this pandemic, people suffering from adverse weather conditions, people suffering from the earthquake in Afghanistan, people suffering from gun violence, this divided nation, our fellow members of the Episcopal branch of the Jesus Movement, Shirley Hart of the Way, at St. Thomas Windsor, and St. Anne's Jacksonville, the Reverend Cynthia Duffus Rector. Those who celebrate birthdays this week, Anjali Hewitt-Sline, Kim Bunch, Roy Sawyer, Carolyn Thiel, 
Libby James and Daniel McCavish, and those who celebrate wedding anniversaries this week, Johnny and Claudia Griffin, and David and Julie Shields. To thine never failing care and love, for this life and the life to come, knowing that thou art doing for them better things than we can desire or pray for through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time, I ask for your intercessions and thanksgiving. Keep your silent for the Lord. Amen. Please join in the general thanksgiving found on page 101. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and for all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving of ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you promise through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our recessional hymn is number 559.